a person exposed to the sun's ultraviolet rays at the equator in summer would have no slightest concern that the intensity of the stress would be high enough to threaten the physiology sufficiently as to cause an adaptive response, a suntan. While the imposition of a high-intensity sunlight stress is the primary causal determinant or first necessary cause, it would not be sufficient cause to affect the development of an optimal suntan. The suntanner's primary concern, his overriding consideration, would be related to secondary and tertiary causes, the proper regulation of the volume and frequency of the exposure time so as not to overdose on the stress stimulus and incur a sunburn or in extreme cases death. A person exposed to high intensity sunlight stress does not fret as to whether he'll succeed in achieving his goal, an optimal suntan, but only so long as he doesn't overexpose. Bodybuilders utilizing the blind, non-theoretical volume approach to training do fret continuously over the prospect of ever developing their muscles because they know absolutely nothing about the nature of the causes required to affect the development of muscles beyond normal levels. They are completely ignorant of the first cause required by nature, training to failure to stimulate the body's growth mechanism into motion, and they remain solely concerned with volume and frequency. Unlike the sun tanner, however, who is rationally concerned with the proper regulation of the exposure of the sunlight stress, the bodybuilder has an irrational obsession with overimposing the training stress. The theory of sun tanning, by the way, is essentially the same as the theory of muscle building, both of which derive from the theory of stress physiology. Recently, one of my phone clients expressed considerable astonishment that he was able to make so much uninterrupted progress with heavy-duty, high-intensity training. And I explained to him that such should not be a surprise, that there's no mystery to any of this, that people have been growing larger muscles for thousands of years, that we live in a knowable, rational universe of absolute, clear-cut identity, guided by one set of never-changing principles, and that the cause-effect relationship between intense exercise and muscle growth has been understood for quite some time, even though the vast majority of self-styled experts here don't seem to grasp it. I concluded by explaining to this individual that it is reality and its laws, the laws of nature, that dictate what causes must be enacted to affect the buildup of muscle mass beyond normal levels, and that once these causes are understood, the task of building bigger muscles while requiring high-intensity effort is actually rather simple. With a proper understanding of the law of causality, bodybuilding progress should be, will be immediate, continuous, and nothing short of spectacular through to the full actualization of one's muscular potential in one year or less. That's right, it is possible to actualize your full muscular potential in one year or less. While anyone should be able to actualize his muscular potential in one year, no one can guarantee exactly what his potential is, as the prime determinant of bodybuilding success is genetics. And although the subject of genetics, or inherited characteristics, is widely recognized as of central importance in bodybuilding and athletics, it is rarely understood. Individuals inherit characteristics peculiar to their parents and not common to the species, examples of which are height, eye color, blood type, and body type. These are referred to as fixed genetics traits and thus not typically subject to alteration from exogenous influences. There do exist other inherited traits, however, such as intelligence and muscle size that are not absolutely fixed and can be progressively altered, although within a genetically prescribed range along with specific psychological motivational factors that the individual must possess or acquire in order to achieve his goals, genetic element is the primary factor determining both the rate of response to intense exercise and the degree of muscular development. So, while anyone can improve upon his level of muscular development with proper training and nutrition, only a small percentage will possess the requisite genetic traits to become champions. The most visible of the physical characteristics necessary for the development of a top physique is related to the skeletal structure, the formation of the bones, 
dictates not only how much muscle can be supported, they also determine a significant aspect of the aesthetic quality of the physique. Though the size of the skeleton figures in how much muscle can be supported, the actual size potential of a muscle is determined to a significant extent by its length. Skeletal considerations and muscle belly length, however, are only two inherited characteristics which affect physique potential, and were discussed briefly here merely to introduce the listener to the subject. There are numerous others, including muscle fiber density and recovery ability, an elaboration of which is beyond the scope of this work. For those interested in more information on the role of genetics, I suggest you refer to my book, Heavy Duty One. I am often amazed by the Sisyphean efforts of bodybuilders who are willing to train for hours a day, every day for months and years, with literally little or nothing to show for their efforts. It is almost as if they're waiting for a zap out of the mystical realm of whims, wishes, and hopes to one day deliver them their much dreamed of muscles. If you are such an individual, wake up and stop wasting your time. If your present program hasn't been yielding progress for weeks, let alone months or years, it isn't going to start doing so tomorrow. Presumably your life is sacred, and the achievement of your goals is of great value significance. It is important, having set a goal, that you successfully achieve it, as the implications to your confidence, happiness, and self-esteem are crucial. With a properly conducted, heavy-duty, high-intensity training program, you will grow stronger and larger literally every workout until you reach the upper limits of your muscular potential. Yes, as I've already stated, in one year or less. Given your present state of knowledge, such may seem impossible. But remember, it wasn't all that long ago that the great American unwashed thought we'd never get to the moon. Impossible, they said. Of course, without any knowledge of the scientific principles of cosmology or astrophysics, reaching the moon might seem like an insurmountable task. And without the knowledge of the scientific principles of high-intensity anaerobic exercise stress physiology, yes, the idea that you could actualize your muscular potential in one year or less would seem impossible. Let me remind you that man has not only been to the moon, but he has gone and returned safely many times. Sending a man to the moon is an enormously complex task or goal, requiring the application of theoretical knowledge from a constellation of intellectual disciplines, including mathematics, physics, medicine, biology, physiology, electronics, engineering, computer technology, to name a few. If we can send a man to the moon and return him safely every time, we should be able to succeed with every one of our missions to the gym here on Earth. In fact, it should be a cakewalk compared to a moonwalk. Another reason, in addition to my logical identifications of the facts of reality, why I'm able to communicate on a meaningful level with bodybuilders is quite simply because I am a bodybuilder myself. Many of the hopes, dreams, doubts, and fears you may have experienced as a bodybuilder, I've experienced too. So, while it is true that we are all unique as individuals, each in possession of an unrepeatable, irreplaceable personality, it is also true that as human beings we share many things. This brings to mind another statement from Arthur Jones, the man who taught me not only much of considerable value about the nature of exercise, but also about thinking in human beings. On the subject of shared experiences and issues, Mr. Jones said, Mike, if you want to understand others, merely look inside of yourself. Mr. Jones's concept has served me very well over the years as a type of orienting principle with regard to my writing. When searching for a subject or issue to serve as a topic for an article, I would merely invoke Jones's dictum and ask myself, okay, look inside of yourself with regards to this matter. Identify and isolate what you find most relevant interesting and exciting as both a bodybuilder and a human being, and others will find it likewise. Those shared matters are referred to philosophically as fundamental issues. A fundamental issue, dear listener, is one that pertains to all members of the species, an inescapable part of human existence. Examples of fundamental issues are, is the world knowable or is it mysterious and unknowable? 
our reason and logic man's sole means of gaining knowledge, or our emotions superior means of cognition? Is man a rational, efficacious being, capable of success and happiness, or is he a congenital incompetent, doomed to perpetual doubt and despair? Is the struggle to gain knowledge and learn how to think for myself worth it? Or is obeying and pleasing others more important? Should I passively accept the dominant culture's values? Or should I look outside the culture to the grand scale context of the history of ideas for something better? Whether one should work to develop a more muscular body is not fundamental, for the issue does not inevitably arise in the course of a normal human life. What is fundamental is whether it is proper to strive for goals at all. And as a title winner, I'd be the last to suggest that developing a more muscular physique is not a worthy goal. A muscular physique, however, is not a viable substitute for a mature mind. That is, a mind with a conceptual grasp and intellectual understanding of the fundamental issues of human life. While you are free, dear listener, to evade the effort and responsibility required to learn how to think and judge independently, and thus deal successfully with that which is of most fundamental importance in human life, you are not free to evade the consequences. No, big muscles do not confer a halo onto your crown or provide one with intellectual confidence and self-esteem. I have known a number of top bodybuilders, men of extraordinary muscular development, who suffered from profound lack of self-esteem, who, despite all their trophies and the public adulation, were riddled with self-doubt and beset by psychological conflicts they had no slightest clue how to resolve. None of this was the result of a deficient or malfunctioning brain. No, they were intellectually self-arrested. Each had apparently decided at an early age that he had learned enough. One of them was a bodybuilder of the absolute first rank, who despite being well known for his massive development, was plagued by chronic doubt as how to proceed with his training, and marred by a number of serious character flaws. While training at Gold's Gym, where I conducted my personal training business, this individual befriended one of my clients, a rank beginner with no muscle to speak of. I was surprised to learn later that the heavily muscled champ had called my client on a number of occasions, once at three in the morning, to ask if there was really any merit to this heavy-duty, high-intensity training, and whether or not he should forsake the volume approach and give it a try. Many make the unwarranted assumption that the top bodybuilding champs must be experts on the subject of exercise. After all, they have the muscles. It is a mistake, however. One cannot cite the apparent success of a couple of dozen of top bodybuilders as indubitable proof that a certain training approach is effective or superior. If one were to look back through the course of their training careers and calculate the hours, months, and even years of wasted effort, time during which they made no progress, one would have to question whether their achievement could properly be termed success at all. You'd conclude by scratching your head and wondering, didn't these men have anything better to do with their time? And many apparently did not. The chant mentioned above, for instance, never gave much time to thinking about his moral character and his development. I can clearly recall a couple of instances in Gold's Gym where this imposing giant of muscle used his greater size to intimidate others of lesser physical stature, once because a person accidentally got in his way while walking to the water fountain for a drink between sets. And I know from an unimpeachable source that there were those who helped this individual financially to get his business started. Their largesse was motivated by sheer benevolence and goodwill, yet were never paid back. It was also widely rumored that he regularly beat up his girlfriends when they didn't wait on him hand and foot precisely as he pleased, which may or may not be true. Obviously, the point is, big muscles are not the measure of a man. As much as these tapes are about the human body and its improvement, they are also about the mind and its improvement. Why would an audio tape series on bodybuilding also be about the mind? Because human intelligence, of course, is what makes it possible to understand anything at all, including exercise, bodybuilding science, and that which is most interesting. 
and that of course is us. We the members of the species man, the divine spark in the great chain of being, the highest of all living species on earth. It has been averred all too often that bodybuilders are dumb or stupid, which simply isn't true as evidenced by the number of phone calls I receive from intelligent bodybuilders every day. These include people from all walks of life, such as medical doctors, lawyers, physicists, stockbrokers, students, and tradesmen, all who happen to be bodybuilders as well. I will not talk down on the assumption that the listener so lacks intellectual depth that he is incapable of exercising the mental effort required to integrate knowledge of a higher order. Nor will I insult your intelligence by expecting you to accept anything I say simply because I've won a few bodybuilding contests. It is only on the basis of grasping the logical truth of an argument that one should agree. I will not bore you with the type of intellectual pablum or garbage you've read so often in some of the muscle magazines. In case you hadn't noticed, the vast majority of articles written on the subject of training consist of little more than a series of arbitrary, out of context, biblical-like commandments, thou shalt perform four sets of this exercise, and thou shalt perform five sets of that one. Why? Blank out, no reason, no logic. The realm of the intellect is more demanding than the average bodybuilding writer recognizes, and that formulating a valid, non-contradictory theory of training requires knowledge of the nature of human physiology, as well as knowledge of the nature of man's mind, and his method of using it, logic. A mere passionate discharge of the arbitrary contents of one subconscious onto a piece of paper is just that, intellectual vomitus. As a man of reason, I act only on the basis of understanding the reasons for doing something, as all mature adults should, and that is what these tapes are about. A reason principled approach to bodybuilding, one that can be learned by anyone willing to exercise the required mental effort. I presume, after all, that you purchase these tapes because of your enthusiastic desire to be a successful bodybuilder, whether to actualize your muscular potential for personal reasons, or to be Mr. New England, Mr. Midwest, or Mr. Olympia, and that you already understand that the basis of a rational approach to bodybuilding, or any other arena of endeavor, is the recognition that only the specific appropriate knowledge can lead one to engage in the purposeful action required to achieve a goal. No, the material on these tapes is not infinitely complex, but it's not intellectual pabulum either. Why not cast aside all other concerns for now, get intense mentally, focus on the logic of my ideas, and once and for all clear up any and all confusion? Then you will be able to proceed with the greatest power possible to a human being, the power of certainty. It only stands to reason that a serious bodybuilder should want to know that the ideas guiding his training efforts are true ideas. And how will he ever come to distinguish true ideas from false ideas unless he learns something about the nature of ideas or knowledge? To settle for anything less than certainty about the truth of the ideas guiding you in the pursuit of your life's goals is to abdicate your most fundamental responsibility as a human being and leave your life literally to chance. I entered into a personal renaissance of my own once I began a serious formal study of philosophy and learned something about the nature of knowledge. I learned that knowledge, like everything else that exists, has identity and nature. Human knowledge is hierarchical in structure. It has a foundation or base consisting of fundamental principles which must first be grasped before one may move upward in logical progression to more complex derivative knowledge. This may be most readily observed in mathematics where the fundamentals are addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. It is only on the basis of having grasped these fundamentals that one may move up the logical hierarchy to derivative aspects such as algebra and calculus. Algebra and calculus, in other words, are logically based on and derived from an understanding of the fundamentals. There does exist a viable intellectual discipline, exercise science. On tape number two, I will explain the logically interdependent hierarchy of ideas that may...
the context of bodybuilding science, again, so that you may learn to think logically about the subject and go on to confidently and successfully achieve your bodybuilding goals. Before concluding, however, I am going to address one important issue which will serve as a direct prelude to the material on tape two. And it has to do with the near universal confusion that exists with regard to the fact that there can only be one valid theory of proper productive bodybuilding exercise or any other subject. This confusion is centrally responsible for most of the failures in bodybuilding. And I can tell you unequivocally, without a doubt, more fail to achieve their bodybuilding goals than succeed. Most bodybuilders make the mistake of approaching the subject of training with the idea that all training theories have some merit or are of equal validity, then they waste precious, precious time, frantically trying one after the other in the hope that someday, somehow, some way they'll find one that works. And as a result, few bodybuilders achieve their goals. It could not possibly be true that all or many, or even two, training theories are valid, since a theory is a set of abstract principles which purports to be either a correct description of some aspect of reality and or a guide for successful human action, and there is only one reality, there is and can be therefore only one valid theory of any aspect of reality. There's no debate on the subject, just as there is only one valid theory of epistemology mathematics, electricity, chemistry, physics, evolution, relativity. Likewise, there is but one true theory of productive bodybuilding exercise. And it just so happens to be the theory of high intensity training. The science of exercise, like the science of medicine, is based on an understanding of the principles of human physiology, which of course are universal, that is applicable to all human beings. If everyone's cells, muscles, and organs were constituted and functioned differently, if everyone was a unique physiologic entity unto himself, medical science could not exist as a viable discipline. Doctors couldn't make diagnoses, perform surgeries, or dispense medicines. It is this fact, the fact that the principles of human physiology are universal, that makes it possible for me to state with absolute certainty there is only one valid theory of training, i.e. one best way to train. It is not my mere opinion that every human being requires intense training to stimulate growth. It is a well-authenticated fact beyond debate. And because the magnitude of the toll on the body's limited recovery ability made by high intensity training is enormous, such training must be brief and infrequent to allow for the production of an increase. The major philosophic theme of these tapes is that without a firm intellectual grasp of and guidance by a valid theory, one cannot be certain he is on the right course. A sane individual setting out on a trip from Los Angeles to New York will consult a map, a map being a theory of how to get from one place to another. Without it, he would get lost, lose whatever certainty and motivation he may have had, and terminate his effort along the way. Knowledge like any other value, has to be gained through a volitional effort. Anyone smart enough to learn the ABCs, write a sentence, or read a book, can, with enough effort, integrate and make use of the knowledge contained on these tapes. It's not likely that you'll get it on the first listening, however, so listen to the tapes repeatedly until you do have a firm grasp. This is the end of tape one. Please go on to tape two the fundamentals of muscular development.